Okay, and now we are back live with two new guests. Here with us this hour is Dr. Anna Poraika and Juan Pablo Pacheco. Welcome both of you and welcome everyone on the live stream. So Dr. Anna Poraika is the author of The Age of Total Images and Culture of the Selfie. She's also a teacher in the Media Arts Culture Program and in the Program for Image Science at Stono University, as well as a teacher in the History Department of the Central European University in Budapest. Her works mainly focuses on technolog technological development of photography and in lens-based media. And Juan Pablo Pacheco is a visual artist and a writer focused around the poetics of digital technologies and their intersection with political, ecological and social systems. You are also one of the artists in the exhibition with the piece Wet Analogies. And the two words you were very recently given to discuss the in-betweenness of are restrictions and play. So please give me your takes. So Juan, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh. You want to say first, yeah? Okay, yeah. then I'll start, yeah. Okay. So we were, we were talking about uh, this um, uh, problem in terms of the border mainly, so just in a couple of minutes before the session started, uh, uh, we were speaking about border and, and the pushing of the border by defining it, not only in physical terms, but being border, but also in some different kinds of meanings. And we're also referring to the problem of censorship as one of these uh, ways of defining the border and defining the role which can be undermined by a play or by those that try to define uh, uh, the role that has been given. Right. Yeah, I think we were talking about there's this, I mean, I think usually when we think about restrictions, um, there are these impositions of uh, borders or categories or even censorship where we're talking about this, uh, things that you can't or can do, things you can or can't say, and how uh, playfulness or playing is about finding maybe the interstices, the, the little cracks in between those categories of what you can and you can't say. But I think now with what you're saying, it also makes me think about to what extent, so if you're playing the game, right? Because this is also a saying in, in English. If you're playing the game, it sort of means that you are playing by the rules, right? That there are some sort of rules that allow you to play the game. And to what extent playing the game and following the rules is its sort of restriction? So to what extent is not playing actually more of a restriction? So like if, if you're not following the rules, if you are not playing by the rules, uh, like how does that constitute as play? So for example, we're talking about the border. So yeah. if you are an undocumented immigrant um, or crossing the border, this restriction, and you don't want to play by the rules, then you, you consider yourself as a very different political subject because you don't play by the geopolitical game. You play in other games. So, I'm also wondering about different levels of play that happen simultaneously. And different levels, of, because yeah, there's in Kaloa, I think he was writing about there is no game that can, uh, that every game is uh, uh, tied to its rules. So if you're not playing by the, by the rules, you're not a gamer of that game. So you're not appreciating other players in the game. And, and basically it's, if I understood you well, they would, uh, with immigrants, it would be the different game being played in the same territory as the like a parallel game being played with completely different set of rules, or with rules that are compatible but uh, as a negation to each other. So they are contra they are working as in the opposite to one another in these two systems of game. Right, and in in that sense. Uh, so the typical saying that like, you know, as an artist or as a creative mind, you, you're you playful within a certain type of restrictions, it really becomes kind of like there's two or multiple worlds that each have their own set of rules because the rules, at least in the real political social world, they are imposed, but they also arise from like survival, right? I mean... Mm -hmm. Your rules are what allows you to keep living to some extent. That's the extent to where your rules go. Um, so I wonder to what extent also the re sometimes the restriction is somebody else's game. It's not like a restriction within your game, but 
you're playing your game under your rules and you know there's another game with other set of rules or laws or restrictions, but your restriction is that game. It's, you know, so it, you're not playing the same game against each other. You're playing different games that are like existentially at odds with each other. Uh, like the Mediterranean too, you know, thinking about like a space that has so many different meanings for so many different people crossing it for refuge or uh, I don't know, like fishing or for vacations as tourists or, you know, like what are these games that people are playing in the same space and how each other's game is a limitation to their own game to some extent. It reminds me of the dimensionality of a game. If, if you're speaking in modal logic, we should have more parameters by which we can also create different modalities and different stories that can be consistent in each other. Like for example, if we recall Flatland by William Abbott Abbott, then you're having different layers in which different uh, uh, population is set by different types of rules for their own games and own perceptions. So each set of rules defines not only uh, uh, the world, but also the perception within the world, which makes a certain population of being able to understand the higher dimension or the other world as existing. And this story of dip different and parallel realities and different parallel games, if we call them like that, has been there with us since long time. And, and, and it exists in, in metaphysics as a, a specific type of narrative, but also it exists in science fiction as such, as a possible uh, consistent scenario, which is being accessible to us only by our, our thoughts, uh, thoughts and our thinking, but basically, it, there is no reason to deny the existence of such a scenario by any fact which we have. So for, for that reason, we are believing that scenario is possible. Right. And you make me think now about, um, because so, so right, all of these fiction social uh, scenarios uh, are played within these restrictions, right? You have to somehow believe in those rules to be able to be part of it and to believe in it. But I wonder also now taking this idea of restrictions to a broader sense, uh, like what, like what are very kind of like fundamental inescapable restrictions, like things that we can't do. Like, so for example, like immortality with our bodies or um, uh, like the world, like uh, like the, the the forces of the uh, ecological world to some extent, like that are restrictions, like existential restrictions. We can't <clears throat> kind of like surpass them. And a lot of what has been theorized about art is that it's a play to challenge that, right? It's a play against mortality, against the limitations of the world. But I wondered, like, yes, like, are we all framed to some extent within the same scenario of you die uh, no matter what and the world at least is not in an impending ecological crisis? Is that a type of restriction as well for our play? Well, in, in modal system, it shouldn't be because we can also imagine that this is also kind of description of the system, that uh, what exists is also defined by the system and we cannot experience yet what is behind the border of life. So no one knows and no one can answer the question if there is something as an afterlife and what happens and by which scenario the extinction, the extinction is going to go and are we going to invent something. So basically according to the logical system, it's still, it's just a modality of existence still. Maybe there is something it's still else. still fiction to some extent. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Though in, in reality, if we are not that much uh, skeptical uh, I think it's possible and it's, it's, we, are, we are facing concrete limits there. And we can also take the paradigm of a computer and programming and think about a computer with no electricity and, and try to see if there is a really some kind of basic limit which forbids uh, development of, of different kinds of scenario. And if the scenario also has been a part of conspiracy theory as well. If it's the game itself is a conspiracy and for which type of... Uh, from which angle we see it as a positive or a negative, as a, as a paranoid scenario or as something that is just a, a tale to be told. Right. Even though I do think there's a different, I think there's like different sensibilities because, for example, I think within the modernist uh, 
uh, like paradigms, especially like Western modernist paradigms, it's a lot about um, how we can always push the restrictions and push the limits, right? And advance with technology and techno science. The myth of techno science is about that. It's about like, oh, we can't communicate in the 60s, 70s, we invent telematics and cybernetics and now we can communicate around the world. Oh, we can't manipulate and create lab uh, life in a laboratory, now we can create life in a laboratory, right? There's this pushing of limits, but a lot of, for example, uh, Amerindian, like uh, American indigenous knowledge, uh, for example, in the Amazon, which is what I'm more familiar with, um, is more like they, they're always thinking like, okay, yes, you can push all the boundaries you want and you can create li life in a lab. And that doesn't seem very crazy to them because the limits for them are not those. The limits for them are that the world falls out of balance, that the world falls out of place, right? And and that's the limit for them. So So I'm also thinking about like, to what extent there are some myths, but to what extent there there could also be some sort of truths about the balance of things, like how how there's like this uh, system that has maintained for billions of years the world in balance somehow, or like that has allowed life to still happen in the world. I don't know. Yeah, and the myth of progress is basically the illusion which has been given as a scenario and just accepted by the whole culture of the Western, the, the Western culture and development. Think like that, like the progress in terms of being the largest illusion that has been uh, invented as a game and amusement of uh, Western science and, and, and culture. <laughs> yeah. It's my dog here. <laughs> I'm going to present you the, 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 the object. Please do. OK. What's his name? Yeah, he's just a bit boring, but yeah, he's here. Maybe you see his. Uh, <laughs> he tries to get inside the conversation here. I would like to know his take on play and the uh, restriction. <laughs> oh look, that he's playing there. She's playing. Is it she? He? They? He thinks it was really a good thought. I think about the progress. Maybe he has. Okay. I'm not sure if in this scenario we are thinking uh, that he. Uh, that's something that we concern as a language and and, uh, and the way of interpretation as such exists also in different species. And if our ideas of the progress and the supreme race, which has been really challenged by this COVID virus now, uh, mm. this the idea of supremacy, the rule that has been set by humans in which we are at the top of hierarchy and controlling everything, which is completely destabilized by this uh, super powerful virus, which behaves as more intelligent than humans at this point. He's just right, like very, the most intelligent thing that has happened in the years. Yeah. In he plays onto us, basically, yeah. And then challenges the idea of these types of intelligence as uh, in terms of restrictions and definitions, we have been uh, putting and inserting in the basis of our science and thought as a human definition of intelligence. Right. And, you know, and... and yeah. yeah, and that there's also something about play that, uh, at least in the traditional way we think about it, requires intention, right? Like, you, you need to want to play. It's like a decision, like, okay, I'm going to play. It's my decision. And that is very interesting with what about intelligence, because to some extent, uh, it's a lot about, uh, for example, in terms of the virus with, the, with COVID-19, like, to what extent were humans the restriction to which the virus intentionally decided in a very intelligent way to take a decision to like do something. I mean, not the virus itself, but like the whole system of ecological balance, right? Of like, okay, I'm gonna play right now with this whole system. It's time for me to play because there is a clear restriction for my balance, which is human uh, superpopulation under the ca under capitalism, right? Um, playing the game onto humans. But it's also a very interesting thing then when you think about playing the game by virus onto humans, that the game can be played until there is a career. So virus is not successful if he murders the human. Mm. He's successful only if he exhausts and, and parasites on the human. 
Mm-hmm. So basically, that's the problem is that the game. Like the virus dies if the human dies. So. Human dies. So, yeah, and then the game is over, and the adaptability not for for some time. It's not because it's still transferred from uh, the, the other from materials from objects. But after a while, the, the virus will also die, so the game is finished, mm. and uh, and that's the restriction. So we are coming back to the restriction of life and death, as you mentioned previously. Right, Maybe. right, which is someone is capable anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very easy to get to get uh, philosophical in with this uh, kind of weird word, but might, that might not be, you know, the first thought of, of going into philosophy. But I thought it was very interesting that you said that someone's play, someone's rules of play is sort of the, the the rules of one is the play of others, that they sort of are connected in a very, very interesting way. And also that... Um, like what? What is the play and what is the the restriction? Really, is is the play what's creating the restriction, or is it the the play that sort of takes you out of the restriction? That it can be both. I thought it was very interesting that you brought brought that up. Um, yeah, I don't know to what extent. I mean, because there there is something about our imaginary about restrictions that there could be a place without. I mean at least in the way that capitalism has uh, framed the discourse of freedom is about not having restrictions, right? It's about like uh, doing whatever the fuck you want with your life and doing consuming everything you can with your life. You know, this is the crisis that Anna is like pointing at in the mm-hmm. US at least. It's like, I, I mean, that's Elon Musk's like, uh, cra- that's why he goes crazy because he can't go out to fucking H&M and buy clothes for his kid, his newborn child, right? Um, so, so, I, so I wonder in that sense also um, when we talk about restrictions, like and, and in relation to this idea of freedom, I also feel like uh, it, it's kind of like an embedded part of it. I mean, it, it, like you, life is about that to some extent. You can't exist in symbiosis with others if you don't, if you do whatever you want, you know. That, but that's so ingrained in our idea of freedom that we don't have any limits that we are just driving our cars in uh, in the middle of the desert in the u.s uh and and that's our life you know and we have no boundaries and the horizon is fi- infinite you know there's no uh, there's something about that i don't know but how will you know the freedom if you don't know the limits what would be your definition made against so, no, yeah. I would say it's always about limits, but I would say that to some extent, the the popular narrative is uh, is the country is about is about not having limits. It's about the the limitless horizon, the 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 endless consumerism, the freedom to do whatever you want as long as you have the money to. Uh, it's kind of like the narrative that has permeated a lot of society it's about not having limits which is so flawed to some extent but it's, it's, based, it's based on impulses and desires only but it's not a definition which has been made on uh, freedom of thought because for freedom of thought you need plenty of other uh, elements to construct it it's not only the animalistic the animal uh, impulses and and drives towards something towards consumption or or whatever so I think it's 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 much more complicated, and it takes more elements inside definition. Yeah, yeah. Now I'm thinking a lot about that free, like freedom in relation to play and restriction, because I think that's. A, I mean, it's such a um, touched upon word and concept, like freedom, uh, especially in the context of uh, a consumerist society, but. But yeah, I wonder to what extent, like, do you think, would you say we think about freedom more as play? Like, no. that that we think about, I mean, I don't know, I'm yeah. it's kind of a question. No, I'm thinking in a way of defining the freedom in terms of capacity of, uh, is it defining uh, the freedom in regard to your own instincts? So the freedom as instinctive, which means that whichever instinct you have, you are going to fulfill it. You're going to do whatever comes to your first impulse. Or is a freedom something that has a quality which has been thought through and has been weighted and has some kind of philosophical weight? 
So is a freedom something that is banal as uh, you need to go to eat something or is a freedom something that is has it has complex system of references and uh, opinions maybe interpretations and knowledge right yeah i'm just thinking like for example if you enter a space right and and you're give and you're told uh, you have to sit down in your chair and you can't move. Like, you can't move. That's, that's the game, kind of. You can't move. You have to sit on your chair for the next hour. Um, would there still be room to play? And if so, how could you play? And would that constitute your freedom, you know? Like, if you're there sitting down and you can't move your body even if you want to, could you still be free and playful somewhere, somehow else? Uh, and, and for example, now, just that I'm saying this, I'm thinking about people in jail, for example, you know, uh, in prison people. Like, are they still, are they still able to play? Uh, are, could they still be free el uh, somehow else that is not physical mobility, you know? There are plenty of political revolutionaries that were in prison and they were thinking very, very experimental things about freedom which they exercised immediately as they went out so it's from their own biographies it's visible that it's possible to exercise freedom even if you don't speak and even if you are locked inside a small smallest place mm. so it's just um, there was a freedom of thinking which uh, according to Marxists, many people do not exercise because the freedom of thinking also comes with a certain capacities to undermine uh, limits that have been imposed by ideologists. So it's uh, also a set of rules. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's already been 20 minutes. We have one question from the chat. I think we should maybe wrap it up with. Uh, you've answered some of it already, but but we'll, uh, we'll give it a try anyway. Um, can we say uh, that restrictions and limits push us for some kind of liberation, to be more creative, to push ourselves to get that, like some things through which we appreciate our freedom. Yes, of course, because it's, it's a, every definition makes you to measure the distance from you to the definition, to the border, the restriction, and by that you know that you're pro you've made a progress which can give you a nice feeling of uh, to continue pushing the border. Uh, it's like in a Zeno par Zeno's paradox, there's always this small and small things to be pushed to, to redefine the border. And uh, it's only possible to know what you're doing by defining it. So the restriction basically there is in, in a cognitive sense, something that ne is needed in order to define the field of action. Right. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree with what Anna's saying. I would say that maybe my only caution with that uh, premise is that we keep it in mind without romanticizing it. Because I feel like when we romanticize some of these notions, we can easily fall in a trap of like, things are how they need to be, like a little bit deterministic. Like, uh, like for example, like we're saying about prison, like of course so many people, like for example, since Thoreau, Henry David Thoreau wrote, the duty of civil disobedience by being imprisoned uh, and it's such a fundamental text of like the anti-war movements around the world in, in the 20th century but should he have been imprisoned for us to think about that and probably I would say I mean I wish he wasn't you know I mean it, it was such an unfair imprisonment so it's so important and I totally agree but it's important to not romanticize it like, oh, yeah, of course. Of yeah. course. We don't know would he ever thought, if he wouldn't be in these circumstances, would he ever be writing it? So it's, it's really something that we can only guess. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> very interesting I think we have to wrap it up there but thank you very much for this nice discussion you made my job here very easily I feel that we could continue for hours <laughs> more <laughs> but thank you very much both of you for joining and thank, thank you, you people on the chat and the next talk will begin at 5 so stay tuned for that bye Anna bye for now bye, -bye.